a pleasant day to all of our brothers and sisters. As we continue with our program, we shall have a lecture entitled The Power of Renewal to be presented by Linda Oliveira. Linda served as the International Vice President of the Theosophical Society International from October 2008 until late 2011. Two and a half years of this period were spent in Adyar, the Theosophical Society's international headquarters in Adyar, before she returned to live in Sydney. A member of the TS since 1971, Linda joined the Society after hearing some talks from the philosopher J. Krishnamurti. Her tertiary degree at the Australian National University focused on humanities and political science. She has given presentations for the TS in various countries, and her writings have been published in a number of TS journals. She is currently the national president of the Australian section of the society, and also the editor of Theosophy in Australia. A core inspiration in Linda's life is Theosophy, especially its potential to profoundly transform an individual when reflected upon deeply and when practiced with heart and mind. So brothers and sisters, let us all welcome Linda Oliveira. Greetings from Australia. It's a great pleasure to participate in this first ever online TS International Convention. Today I would like to talk about one of the powers in the human being, which to a certain extent is still latent. And that is the power of renewal. Let's think about humanity for a moment. The trajectory of humanity through time has been punctuated by numerous cycles. Cycles of peace, war, intellectual advancement, pestilence, innovation, creativity, and so forth. Periodically, large waves of suffering have engulfed us, such as times of war or political extremism. Then there is the pandemic of this last year, which has dramatically changed lives all around the globe. Of course, periods of group suffering tend to be followed eventually by periods of peace. As well as human cycles, we witness numberless natural cycles. It is possible to learn so much from the world around us. There are vast geological cycles which are followed by periods of massive destruction before some kind of rebirth, perhaps the emergence of a new continent. Then again, this planet has some spectacular forests which have cycled into their potential as mature wooded areas. Yet when a fire sweeps through a forest, numerous trees can be destroyed very rapidly. The charred black remains give no visible hint of what is possible in the future, no indication of what will happen very naturally in the fullness of time. In Australia, there are many eucalyptus trees, as there are in other countries. Many of these have epicormic buds or dormant growth buds deep beneath the bark. These are actually protected from fire, yet after fire, they are triggered into life. Some others have underground lignotubers. These are large roots from which a tree can sprout new growth. Other types of plants have dense fibrous trunks which can recover from fires and yet others have incredibly robust seeds which can germinate either during or after a fire. The renewal of a forest is a kind of miracle after what seems to be total destruction. So in the case of many forest trees and other plants, something endures despite what appears to be complete death. And it is this enduring factor which fans new life when the conditions are right. The possibility of continuity remains. Indeed, the potential for renewal, which is inherent in nature, is an extraordinary power. 
And what about the human being? We are products of nature and by correspondence also possess the power of renewal. We are familiar with the body's various functions and cycles. We know how sleep provides much needed rest so that the body is refreshed and ready for another day of physical action. We know how a period of illness requires more rest than usual in order for energy to be restored and wellness as well. We know how the cycles of age work from youth to middle age to old age. These kinds of renewal are known to us very well. However, what I would like to focus on in this talk is a very real power that we all possess to a greater or lesser degree, and that is the power for renewal within our consciousness. In the wisdom teachings, there are different ways of understanding the human constitution with its various fields of consciousness. Madame Blavatsky described us as sevenfold beings based on the Trans-Himalayan school. Swami T. Subarao favoured the fourfold classification of Taraka Raja Yoga. Subsequent theosophical writers have varied the sevenfold classification to a certain extent. And so the levels or fields within the human constitution have been subjects for discussion and debate down the decades in theosophical circles. They are useful ways of understanding ourselves. I would like to simplify this further though. We can regard our consciousness as operating in two essential ways, either in everyday mode, which is turned outwards towards the world, or else in inward focused mode, which tends more towards the inner worlds. Let us denote them as the external mode and the internal mode. What happens in the long trajectory of human evolution? A soul can become lost in this external everyday mode, completely immersed in physical surroundings and day-to-day -day routines. Routine may be comfortable, and it is certainly useful in certain respects. For one thing, there are physical routines such as the tasks we do every day which are necessary for orderly living. Yet routine also poses problems. We have mental habits or routines which can be insidious. Why? For one thing, the repetition of thought patterns can render us mentally stale, causing us to be literally stuck in certain mental habits and views. For example, every single time we reassert one particular view, what happens? We are reinforcing it a little more strongly. Have you ever found that? It might be a political view, or a judgment about another person, or a limited view of theosophy. In fact, it may be a position about any subject at all. Then that view or thought solidifies and is difficult to dispel. Repetition breeds sameness, and it closes the mind. For that matter, it can also easily lead to boredom. And when we are bored, what do we do? We look for something else to occupy our attention, some kind of distraction, and the cycle goes on. Venerable Professor Samdong Rinpoche presented the following image which is easy to relate to when we consider our minds. He wrote this, The mind resembles a crowded street in which cars, motorcycles, bicycles and people are moving. When we are in the crowd, we are aware only of the rush and fuss about us. But if we look down from the top floor of a tall building, we shall see how large the crowd is and how numerous the people. This rush and fuss which he mentioned helps us to understand the distracted state of the mind very well. That is because various whirlpools of energy which are likened to traffic in this quotation exist in our day-to-day -day consciousness. Some of them are larger, more powerful and noisy, trying to overtake each other and become the main object of our attention. Others are smaller and quieter, yet persistent. They are still there, 
moving along in the mind but usually are not the center of our attention. Now various items of traffic in our mind compete for the position of center stage. Let us take an example. Suppose we are focusing on some task at hand which is going along quite well. We can call this thought A. Then some other matter comes to mind and distracts the attention for a while. Let us call this thought B. Thought A continues, but thought B remains in the background, just like a small car which is out of sight of our rear vision mirror. But then that smaller car begins to persistently move in and out of the sight line of that mirror. We cannot easily shake it off. Thought B may be especially linked to the desire aspect of the mind. Can you relate to this? Probably all of us have experienced this kind of occurrence not just once but many times. We are doing one thing but allow our attention to be drawn by that something else which is like a small car in our rear vision mirror. There may be desire for distraction with a snack or a cup of tea, a sudden impulse to check for messages on our smartphone or to browse the news and so it goes on. Too much traffic in our mind clearly causes us to deviate quite easily from whatever we are doing. Meditators would no doubt be familiar with the way that while they are dwelling on one thing, other thoughts creep in and may even lead them down a different avenue of thought altogether. Distractions are essentially of two kinds. Our own thoughts distract us and we have just considered briefly our mental traffic, but so too do external distractions. Why is it that distractions feature so strongly in human life? We seek and follow them partly because of the thirst for experience and all that this implies. But there is another factor too. This is the fact that humans have a fundamental need for inner refreshment but may not be aware of this. People quite typically seek this outside themselves by keeping up with the latest fads, through a whole range of indulgences, or by engaging in that which is sensational because people want novelty, general gossip, a wish to help alleviate boredom, and so forth. Eventually there is a realization that the pursuit of novelty is simply not enough in life. Why not? Because of a very clear recognition that distractions do not produce lasting happiness. The cycle needs to change. And so the pattern of alternating between concentration and distraction does begin to change. There is less distraction with more focus on our inner life and giving or service. Dr. Besant would have called this the turning point. Those distractions which are outside of ourselves and those which are caused by our mental traffic are replaced in the course of time by an increasingly focused interior search for meaning and a deeper vitality. The individual who is increasingly spiritually aware knows that what is required is to look within and consequently seeks ways of helping this come about. Human consciousness contains the possibility of opening to a fresh vitality. This is inevitable and natural. However, when the mind is unclear, repetitive, distracted, closed, lacking direction, that is, full of traffic, then such a state obviously renders renewal impossible. Now an encounter with renewal can range from something brief to an experience which is significant and lasting. It manifests in different ways. For example, there is a certain renewal inherent in the simple act of giving. 
Dr. Besant talked about what she called the law of sacrifice in her little book, The Laws of the Higher Life. She described this as the life of the spirit, which, quote, consists in giving and not in taking, in pouring itself out and not in grasping, in self-surrender and not in self-appropriation. The life inexhaustible, she said, is found that is ever bubbling up out of the illimitable fullness of the self, that is self with a capital S. This is altruism pure and simple, which HPB also equated with theosophy. Dr. Besant highlighted a somewhat surprising and important principle, which is this. When we give unreservedly, unselfishly, then an interesting thing happens. There may be physical and mental tiredness, and yet at the same time a certain energy seems to manifest in response to that kind of action, which enables one to continue giving. You may have had such an experience. Renewal is related to the opening up of the buddhic faculty. In fact, it is intimately connected with buddhi. Dr. Taimni wrote about what is required for the unfoldment of buddhi in his book Self Culture, a text which is pragmatic and grounded in common sense. Briefly speaking, the three main factors he mentioned in the unfoldment of buddhi are these. Developing strength, purity, and unselfishness of a high order. Therefore, the process is not so easy. He went further into each of these points in the book, which is well worth reading. Reminiscent of the traffic in the mind, which has already been mentioned, he wrote of the need to gather in scattered mental energies and noted that as long as we allow the mind to run in pursuit of all kinds of objects, Without any central aim or self-direction, we are bound to remain enmeshed in the toils of illusion. But the fact is this, anything in life which is worthwhile necessitates inconvenience at times as well as one-pointed effort. Anything in life which is worthwhile necessitates inconvenience at times as well as one-pointed effort. Buddhi exists as a principle in all of us, eventually to be infused into the various layers of our consciousness. Dr. Taimni observed that it has a dual character. When reflected in the field of the intellect, it manifests as spiritual knowledge. But when reflected in the sphere of the emotions working through the astral body, it appears as spiritual love. Therefore, when we become receptive to buddhi, both heart and mind are elevated. Knowledge and love manifest on a higher octave in new ways. St. Paul made a beautiful observation about the renewal of the mind. And be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That appeared in Romans in the Holy Bible. Not conforming to this world has been described as being in the world but not of it. This is a well-used phrase in theosophical circles which implies living and functioning in the world as we need to, yet also maintaining a higher perspective, a deeper view of life, a kind of benevolent detachment, which is not necessarily so easy to do when immersed in day-to-day -day problems. We can also think of the will of God as the will of our interior nature, our spiritual core. And while it is true, that a regenerative faculty lies within us, there is preparation involved in order for one to become sensitive enough for renewal to occur. 
This is because like the opening of a flower, it is something which cannot be forced. The Jataka stories from India tell how the Lord Buddha perfected his spiritual nature by living a series of lives based around unselfishness and kindness prior to becoming the Bodhisattva. In each incarnation a particular virtue was emphasized. Modern theosophical teachings also highlight the fact of our evolution into ever more perfected beings which spans vast periods. Humans tend to be impatient. We so often want immediate answers and faster ways of doing things. After all, the many gadgets we use, such as computers, smart devices and vehicles, are very much centred around speed and power. But the external mode of functioning of the mind needs to allow space for that internal mode of functioning, which was mentioned earlier. This in fact requires the mind to observe itself, and in this process, it slows down with a greater intensity of experience. You might have noticed this. When anything is renewed, it is given a new life, a kind of rebirth. In order for the buddhic faculty or regenerative principle to flourish, its preparation involves a kind of death cycle as we relinquish and transmute aspects of ourselves which are not conducive to awakening to a renewed consciousness. Many will be familiar with the legend of the phoenix bird which rises from the ashes. The Greek name phoenix means bright coloured. This presents in the mythologies of a number of cultures with various representations in art and literature including Greek and Roman writers. A bird of glorious plumage it had a peculiar mode of reproduction. The author Geoffrey Barbalka described this method as follows. Gathering twigs from spice trees, the bird fashioned a nest upon which it sat and thus concluded its cycle of existence. As the phoenix died, the nest burst into flames, thus consuming the body of the bird. Then from the ashes, a young phoenix then from the ashes a young phoenix sprang into life and when strong enough flew to Heliopolis, the city of the sun in Greek, with what remained of the nest dropping it upon the altar of the sun. Now the symbology here is quite beautiful. The French author Voltaire described the bird as being the size of an eagle yet with eyes that were mild and tender. This suggests that it represented a beneficent force in nature. It was said to live for a fabulously long time. Some believed that the phoenix lived for 500 years. For Tacitus it was 1,461 years. Others yet again believed that the bird lived for more than 25,000 years. The existence and life cycle of such a bird may validly be subject to different symbolic interpretations. On one level, the phoenix bird has been interpreted as the human personality, which ceases after one life. From its ashes, a new personality eventually springs into being. The skandhas reignite as it were, and the new personality is born in a subsequent incarnation. Madame Blavatsky actually viewed the phoenix as a generic symbol for seven, several different kinds of cycles. The phoenix manifests in various traditions with different names. For example, in the secret doctrine, we read of the Egyptian Bennu bird as synonymous with the phoenix, pointing both to human reincarnation and cosmic resurrection. A similar bird appears in the Persian tradition. HPB described the Garuda as the Indian phoenix. Chief of the feathered race or birds, the Garuda is depicted as half man and half bird, the vahana or vehicle on which Vishnu, that is Kala or time, is said to ride. 
It was praised by the gods as the highest being and had a brilliant luster. The Garuda is a strong aspect of Indonesian and Thai culture too. What is particularly relevant for our purposes is the application of the symbology of the phoenix to the profound changes which an individual undergoes on the spiritual path. Successive renewals or expansions in consciousness which have been denoted as initiations. In one interpretation of the Hindu Trimurti, the triple deity of supreme divinity, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, are understood as will, wisdom and activity. To relate this to our human cycle of existence, if we take Vishnu as wisdom, then the Garuda becomes the vehicle of wisdom. In this sense, the Garuda can be thought of as an individual in whom the buddhic principle has awakened, through which divine wisdom may be expressed. There is an inner phoenix in all of us, waiting patiently to be born, not just once, but a number of times. Renewal can come in bursts, sometimes unexpectedly. For example, entering silence contains a real possibility of renewal. Many have experienced this. When we become silent even for a short while, then spaces within the higher reaches of our minds inevitably open up. There is good reason, therefore, why so many people choose to go on a spiritual retreat once or more in their life. There may be a sensation of lightness because our burdens are temporarily removed. These interior spaces of our consciousness are uncluttered and they therefore have great vitality. Being closer to the spiritual pole of our nature they contain an unconditioned energy which can percolate through into our everyday consciousness, helping to bring out what is best in us from latency into potency. The process of renewal can begin through simple awareness. The process of renewal can begin through simple awareness. For example, when we see our conditioning for what it is, it may temporarily drop away. It actually takes a lot of energy to maintain all this conditioning. Or renewal may occur when we are focused unselfishly on a task and find ourselves paradoxically with renewed energy afterwards ready to take on more. Recall Dr. Besant's comments about this. The fact is that the more we take our awareness off of ourselves, the more likely we are to gain refreshment of body, emotion and mind. For we can weigh ourselves down. Renewal is inherent in nature and is a significant power within us. Brother Sri Ram asserted, there can be a quality of consciousness which is perennially new. It is the quality of the pure consciousness. We can choose to continue along a path of distraction with much traffic in our minds and perhaps maintain fixed views about things. At times when that traffic is eased, there may be small bursts of renewal. However, the ultimate renewal is synonymous with the spiritual path. This requires a dying to the old in order for us to rise, phoenix-like, from the ashes of who we were, in order to become who we are meant to be. Rather than regarding this as an onerous task, it is important to remember that over time our priorities change, and what once might have seemed too challenging now becomes a natural imperative a call from deep within. For the power of renewal has great strength and beauty, helping to reveal our true nobility and glory, that pure consciousness which we normally mask. On a global scale, the possibility of renewal may also be a silver lining in that dark cloud which is our current pandemic, 
providing an opportunity for humanity to recalibrate and help to constructively reshape the world in a new cycle of more profound awareness. Thank you, Linda, for that thought-provoking presentation. At this time, we shall now open the floor for some questions and answers. And uh, we invite our participants to make use of the Q&A button and type in their questions. In the meantime, let me just uh, ask some of the initial questions, Linda, which have uh, come in. You spoke about Dr. Besant and her comment on the life of the spirit, which is concerned with giving rather, rather than taking. What does it mean to give of oneself in this sense? It's interesting when we think about giving and what that implies. Let's take an example from everyday life. We decide we're going to give a gift to a friend. We select that gift from among some others that are on offer and we hope that somehow our friend will like it. Perhaps we hope the wrapping will be nice and that, that the person will respond uh, and be happy to receive the gift and perhaps also express their gratitude to us. Uh, this kind of giving is quite common. We may have mixed motives. We want to give something to a friend, but by the same token, we're hoping to receive something in return. So it's a little bit of a mixed motive. But what Dr. Besant was talking about was this kind of self-surrender and not self-appropriation. There was a real distinction between doing something for ourselves and kind of giving up ourselves in a way in the process of giving. So it's a different kind of giving. It's, it's giving of ourselves completely from all the levels of our being. So we're not just giving something superficially and hoping that someone will say something nice or other people might come to know about the gift or something like that. So it's a different kind of thing, really. Um, it's, it's pure altruism. There's, there's no, no wish for reward. And interestingly, uh, HPB mentioned that, that human regeneration is based on altruism. This was also mentioned in the previous session, the question and answer session to this subject of altruism. But this, this pure altruism, this giving of ourselves wholly and completely without conditions is um, that, that's regenerative uh, and it's a different kind of giving altogether from the ordinary everyday giving that we might think about in our lives. So we can give a gift to another person, for example, but, but give it with perhaps mental good wishes to the person, um, some sort of thought for their well-being uh, and, and no hint of any desire for reward. And that starts to touch on the kind of um, giving that I think is really referred to here. Okay, thank you. I recall you mentioned earlier that after serving or giving, one may be exhausted physically or mentally, but there is some kind of second wind that comes along. Yes, it's okay. quite interesting. I mean, for example, you can be very tired at the end of a day after doing something and yet you wake up the next day, but there's, there's even a, more of an impulse to give. So, so something happens. There's some renewal there inside by that very act of giving. It's quite beautiful. Exactly. Okay. Let me go to uh, the next question. Your talk mentioned the mythical phoenix bird. What actually has to die if we are to rise phoenix-like from the ashes? Yes, well, as mentioned, the phoenix bird can be subject to different interpretations. Um, one can regard it as symbolic of the human reincarnation story. The fact that one life comes to an end, the physical body and various 
uh, aspects of ourselves dissolve and then they are gathered together again in another life. So that's one way of thinking about um, what might die uh, in terms of the symbology of the phoenix. But really, if we think about a renewal in a very fundamental sense, then that um, phoenix for the human being represents really a dying to all that is old, a dying to all that is personal, a dying to all of those things which hold us back from being truly free and from truly giving, uh, a dying to our prejudices, uh, a dying to irritability, a dying to impatience, uh, dying to anger, dying essentially to self-centeredness, self-importance, all those things that tie us very much to this earth and uh, prevent us from opening to our divine nature, uh, which, which therefore um, hampers the possibility of renewal. And of course, in um, certain traditions, the, this, this question of dying is gone into and uh, one uh, sometimes comes across the idea that we should be able to die to every day at the end of the day. We perhaps review what we've gone through during the day and let go of things which are not going to really be very helpful in the longer term, going to sleep and then get renewed again the next day. So the principle of um, dying, whether it's physical dying or a kind of psychological dying to certain things, um, and then a renewal as a result of that is a very important one echoed in many ways throughout nature. But here we're talking about a much more profound kind of dying. Okay. Okay. Here's a practical question asking, why is it that the everyday mind has so much traffic? That's, that's an interesting question. I did like this particular, particular image of traffic in the mind because it can be like that at times as though the mind is a, a kind of crowded road with all sorts of thoughts going along in it and competing for attention. Um, so why does it have so much traffic? Well, I guess... When you consider the, the life of a human being, we're on a journey through this sensate world. All sorts of things vie for our attention at any given time. Uh, and it can be very distracting sometimes to, to have this happening and, and uh, to um, not, not to be able to focus on what we're doing. So there are distractions around us, certainly. Uh, but I think the mind over a long series of lives, if you like, the, the whole mental faculty is something which has uh, kind of uh, grows stronger as time goes on. Um, we can become more full of knowledge. We, we um, perhaps don't, um, we're not so good at being still as we might be. So that's one reason also why we have so much traffic in the mind. It's not possible to perhaps just quietly observe and allow things to drop away. And that's why for people who have meditated for a long period of time, the, the quality and the amount of that traffic in the mind uh, really can and does diminish. So it's, it's a way in which we use the mind, a way in which we exercise the mind, the things which impinge on us as well. Uh, and, and we're also very desire-driven, very desire-driven. So the desires that we have tend to lead our mind down various alleyways as well, uh, various avenues of interest. Uh, and so this is another big factor in the way the, the mind has a lot of traffic in it. So um, what to do to, to help eliminate this desire? Well, HPB in her book on practical occultism, which is a rather tough book, but, but an amazingly inspiring book, talked about eliminating desire by constantly steeping the mind in 
the divine, something like that. So to steep our, our mind in things divine, it's really quite lovely uh, because it, it helps enable the mind to function in a different way. I mean, imagine steeping our minds as far as possible every day in, in what is true, in what is beautiful, in what is good. We so often dwell on uh, negative things. We have news coming to us all the time, uh, which, which feeds the mind in a certain way. Uh, and we have things which feed our desires as well. But by steeping ourselves in that which is divine, consciously doing that, uh, amazing things can happen. Yes, I guess uh, nowadays uh, the uh, challenge is greater. As you had mentioned, there are a lot of distractions, uh, smartphone gadgets, and all of these things on the internet. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Here's another question, Linda. You quoted from St. Paul, who advocated not conforming to this world, but instead be being transformed by the mind's renewal. Should we all therefore become nonconformists? It's a very interesting uh, quotation, that one, and I'm sure it's been interpreted in various ways by people. So this implies that being a conformist can hamper the renewal of the mind. I suppose in a sense we all need to be able to function in the world and to do that to some extent we do need to conform with the social mores of the society we live in or whatever. That conformity is um, necessary in a sense, if you want to call that conformity. It's perhaps respect for the culture that we live in or if we travel, respect for another culture as well. But the thing is, by blindly conforming to conditions around us, we're doing ourselves a disservice because we are not really perhaps thinking for ourselves. We're not necessarily uh, listening to our, our inner self, if you like. Uh, and then we get things that come up, for example, which might be, there might be a, a decision to be made, which is a question of conscience. And that, that conscience that we have may happen to happen not to conform with the society around us. Uh, and so uh, in that sense, maybe conforming is not necessarily a good thing from our point of view at all. Uh, and that non-conformity on a particular issue, whatever it is, it might just be our lifestyle compared with the general lifestyle of society or something like that, requires us to step outside the box a little bit, think differently, uh, and, and in that, in that moment of clarity, um, of listening to our voice deep inside, there is a kind of renewal there in the mind. Uh, and this is a small example, but um, ultimately, perhaps it's a question of learning to really think for ourselves uh, and not necessarily to be swayed by the views of anyone around us. Um, this, of course, is one of the wonderful things about the Theosophical Society because of the principle of freedom of thought, which has been upheld from the very start. And that, that principle of freedom of thought is something which uh, has the potential to help us become renewed if we don't follow blindly things that we are told or, or teachings that we we come across books that we read, but actually really think about them and take them in. Joy Mills used to talk about making something your own. Um, you, you'd have some sort of idea, you would work with it and you would, would make it your own. You would in, 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 uh, internalize it and give it a certain life within you. Uh, so these are perhaps some examples of um, the question of being a non-conformist and the renewing of the mind. Not exhaustive, obviously. Okay, yes. 
uh, we still have time and uh, the questions are coming in. Uh, here's another one. What is pure consciousness, which brother Sri Ram referred to in a quotation you mentioned? Well, you know, this is a little bit like in the previous session, the, the question of, I think it was the mystic state or something like that. Um, one can talk about what is pure consciousness, uh, but ultimately is an experience which is beyond language, beyond words. But one can attempt to try to describe it. Um, if one thinks of a very serene lake, a very still lake, uh, one can see the reflection of perhaps mountains in the lake. And there is a, a different perception from the perception that occurs if there are ripples on the lake, supposing a boat has just gone by or something like that. Um, it, there's a complete and utter stillness. It's not conditioned by anything. Um, that, that surface of the lake, which can be thought of as being like the mind, has no ripples. And therefore, it gives a true, beautiful and pure and accurate reflection of um, what there is beyond that lake. So perhaps it's a little bit like that. Pure consciousness can be thought of as um, a state of truth, a state of um, intense quiet, state of silence. Uh, these are all words, of course, but perhaps they give some kind of idea about what, what that pure consciousness is like. It, it is untainted. It is at the base of our nature. We talk about the self being um, who we really are uh, and Maybe there are times when uh, there are some breakthroughs and there's, it's as though something comes through into the consciousness, whether it's during meditation or at some other, um, during some other activity. Um, and, and there's this sense of a, a tremendous um, strength, serene strength behind all things. Uh, maybe it's a little bit like that. Ultimately, the experience, when translated into words, um, will we'll lose something. But these are a few ways of thinking about it. Okay. Uh, we have uh, some more. Let's see if we can cover them. Here's uh, one. What is actually renewing within the human being? The inferior quaternary and or the superior Ternari, or everything. How is this related to the phoenix bird? <clears throat> if we think about what is actually renewing, one of the, the pivotal things in the evolution of the human being is the mind. The mind, when it's turned earthwards functions in a certain way it, it functions in that everyday mode when it's turned if you like inwards and upwards um, towards the divine uh, steeped in things divine to use uh, Blavatsky's term then it is quite different again what tends to happen with the human being is we spend a lot of time with the mind outward turned towards earthly things and we need to do this because we have to live and function in the world but many many people don't give sufficient attention to the inner life and so the mind itself is not used to its full potential uh, and it can become stale, it can become old because there may be a lot of uh, energy put into memories, a lot of energy put into anticipations of what might be, a lot of energy put into all those things which the desires um, uh, cause the mind to, to do. 
um, things that the desire, the ways in which the desires affect the mind. So I think, in a sense, what fundamentally needs to be renewed is the mind. And if the mind can be refreshed and function in a different way, uh, then then everything is changed. Everything is renewed as a result of that. Uh, but that that mind is like that pivot um, and when that pivot is right, when we can pivot beautifully between um, attending to things in the world and turning the mind inwards when it's not otherwise engaged, um, then that is an extraordinary thing. And, of course, one of the theosophical teachings is about the antakarana in the mind itself. And as one allows certain things to drop away, to die, that antakarana uh, opens up so that uh, we have a very beautiful window on, uh, on the unity of life, uh, which is also a reflection of our inner nature. Uh, in terms of the phoenix, um, you, I think part of the question was how does that relate to the phoenix, yes? Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's a question also of um, what in, in the mind that needs to be renewed um, needs to die. And that was addressed a little bit in a previous question as well. So there, there are things that ultimately drop away naturally. Um, Krishnaji would have said something like, if we pay attention to something, if we see something within ourselves, we don't have to do anything that, that change will come about. Um, but perhaps most of us don't actually are not willing to really look at ourselves in that way uh, and we don't look at ourselves completely but but things like um, anger and resentment and irritability and things like that um, excessive preoccupation with um, things of a material nature these sorts of things give way to a life which is lived with a concern for the other more and more, uh, with a real understanding for the unity of life, uh, to greater compassion and wisdom, things like that. Okay. Uh, we have uh, another one here. You have talked about mental patterns and habits. What can we do? Uh, presumably that refers to what can we do to try to break out of those mental yes. patterns and habits. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the first instance, we need to really learn to look at ourselves and look at our minds, watch our minds. To actually spend five minutes watching the mind is very educative and quite illuminating. And you can see sometimes that there are these um, things that we come back to again and again and again that we need to break out of. Now, obviously, if you are an individual who has a, a serious mental problem, then my first advice would be seek professional help. But um, otherwise, for someone who is really concerned about uh, living a more spiritual life and becoming more open and more flexible, maybe we can start a little bit each day by just trying to, uh, observing certain mental patterns and decide, well, today I'm going to try and do something about this. Uh, I always think a negative thought, well, I regularly think a negative thought about such and such a person. And to become aware of this uh, and then determine that whenever such a thought arises, I am going to replace it with something which has the opposite quality. Send that individual um, a, a thought of love or strength or something like that. I believe implicitly in the power of thought. We can do a great deal in this way. We can't easily necessarily stop ourselves from thinking negative thoughts, but if we become aware of them, we can actually consciously replace them 
with something else which helps to counteract them. It, it neutralizes them and we become a better person as a result of that. Um, a member of the TS many years ago spoke about uh, the idea of selecting for ourselves some sort of a symbol that represents the highest in us, not something necessarily highly emotive because that's going to not work so well, but to think about um, if something negative comes up in our mind, for example, to bring that symbol up in our consciousness. And it's very, very interesting how that can sometimes immediately dissipate some kind of mental habit that we um, are not very happy about in ourselves. So there are a few thoughts. Okay. Uh, there are still some more questions, but at this point, we have used up uh, the uh, time allotted for us, uh, Linda. So we'll have to uh, conclude uh, this session. We thank Linda for her presentation, as well as taking in uh, these uh, questions uh, that she has answered recently. And of course, uh, we uh, thank our team in Adyar for helping us with the uh, uh, presentations. At, in about five minutes after we conclude, we will hand over the uh, presentations of various Theosophical Order of Service sections in Asia. So with that, we thank Linda. We thank our participants for uh, their kind attention. I am Charlie Romero here in the Philippines, wishing everyone a pleasant day. Thank you. Thank you.